the fact that I can three, see three fellow survivors and hear a fourth uh, all on technology is pretty cool. But what's even more cool about that is when I was diagnosed in 2003 and went searching to find some fellow uh, melanoma patients, it wasn't that easy. So um, today we're going to talk about our journeys and really that the fact that there's four of us on the screen compared to back in 2003 is pretty as exciting in itself. So uh, I've been told I have to keep my uh, my conversation to seven minutes, um, which is a little tough because my journey started in 2003 and it was quite in, uh, intense and extensive. Um, and really the whole idea of this uh, webinar today is to really talk about the difference between melanoma cancer's patients back in 2003 and 2005 compared to the uh, cancer melanoma patient's journey today, because they can be a little bit different. So um, I'll start. I was a huge sun worshiper and an outdoor athlete. Um, British skin, always burning or trying to tan. Uh, and in 2002, I went to my GP because I had a mole and a lump on my left arm. I uh, had three visits with her that year, only to be told that it was nothing. Uh, fatty tissue on my arm, not to worry. By the Mother's Day of 2003, when I went back, I was told I had metastasized malignant melanoma and that I needed to go home and get my affairs in order and to talk to my family. Uh, so as a family, our world kind of spiraled, spiraled out of control. I was in an oncologist's office the next day over at Lionsgate Hospital in North Vancouver the day after that to start a treatment called interferon. I had five weeks of high-dose radiation, uh, five weeks high-dose interferon, and then I started injecting myself three days a week for the remainder of the year. Uh, that treatment uh, was intense. I got incredibly skinny. I lost my hair. I barely got out of bed that full year. But when I popped my head out from under the covers on Mother's Day of 2004, I got in my car, got dressed, and headed to work, uh, only to be told I needed to go home and figure out how I could kind of come back into normal life as I would now know it. Within six months of going back to work, I had a chest x-ray. It was clear. Uh, three weeks later, I was wisping. I went in for another chest x-ray, uh, only to be told I had a 14 centimeter mass in my left lung and that the lung would have to be removed. My oncologist said I was too young to take out such an uh, important body part. So I was told I could go on a chemotherapy that they know would work or didn't work within the three rounds. I had my first two rounds, was told it didn't work. Uh, going in for the third round, uh, my son was with me and told the doctor that he had been in touch with the doctor in the US, that there was a clinical trial for me. Uh, and within 24 hours, I had flown to Edmonton, Alberta to the cross to meet with the doctor, Michael Smiley. Uh, there would be a cost to that treatment. I would have to travel to get it or else I could go into the US for it and it would all be free. The problem with that drug, which is the IL-2, was that the side effects were so severe that actually death uh, could be one of them, and I wanted to make sure I was as close to home as I could be. So I had the four cycles of that drug. I um, had a partial response right after the first week. It was pretty exciting because what I didn't know at that time was my cancer was not only in my kidney, but it also was in my bone, my adrenal gland, my kidney, my liver. Uh, so I was pretty well full. And before I had gone to Alberta, I had been told that I'd be lucky if I got three to six months. So I was pretty excited. I got a partial response. But within another six months of that, uh, my melanoma came back into my small bowel. I went in to have it surgically removed. Uh, at that time, I had started the foundation, the Save Your Skin Foundation. I was in Banff speaking at a melanoma conference. And my doctor from Edmonton, Alberta, kind of chased me out and said, Kathy, we have a new clinical trial on one of the newer uh, versions of immuno-oncology. Uh, you qualify and we would like to get you started. So I flew to Edmonton, Alberta uh, every 21 days. I had four cycles of the Uroid. I was one of the first Canadians in Canada to uh, get that treatment. Um, we didn't know much about it then. Um, so right after my four doses, I had a CAT scan and they discovered that uh, the small uh, tumor in my kidney was growing a little bit, so rather than take any chances, we removed the kidney, uh, only to realize years down the road that with immuno-oncology, sometime there can be a progression before regression, so I might not have had to give up that body part, 
Uh, but all in all, since 2009, since the surgery at the kidney, uh, I have been clear. So um, it's been a uh, long, uh, oh my goodness, 14 years. Uh, even though I'm clear, I'm always nervous to say I'm clear. I get my appointments uh, yearly with my oncologist. I just had an appointment a couple weeks ago. Uh, I have to go in for CT scans in the next couple weeks. That, as everybody who's going to speak behind me can tell you, is a tad nerve-wracking. Uh, our life as a family has changed forever. Our new normal is a little bit different, but I am so thankful to be alive. I think I'm one of the longest melanoma survivors uh, in North America, I've been told. But I'm so thrilled that I've got some fellow melanoma survivors here in Canada up here with me today. So I will pass along back to you, Sabrina, and uh, let's hear from our next uh, panelist. Yeah, and that will be Shannon. So Shannon, if you could share your story with us. Sure. Um, I was first diagnosed with melanoma in 2005. I had a small mole on my arm. And actually in 2004, my fiance at the time, who's now my husband, uh, noticed it and wanted me to get it checked out. And I had never heard of melanoma before. So I went to my family doctor and she's like, oh, it's nothing. Don't worry about it. It's, it's your husband's just being paranoid. So thankfully, he kept on me about the fact that he didn't like the look of it. So just, bef just after we got married in 2005, I went in finally to a drop-in clinic where the guy didn't even know me from Adam and he took one look at it and said yeah I'd want that off my arm and I thought well, that's kind of weird and so I went to um, he sent me to a dermatologist where he removed it and I went back two weeks later but he at the time he told me it was looked atypical could be cancerous but he didn't think it was anything so he took it off and when I went to back two weeks later to get the stitches taken out he told me it was uh, melanoma but it was a low risk melanoma. I think it was a Clark 4. It was only 0.72 millimeters deep. So you'll probably be fine, but just get checked by your dermatologist. Look up more information on the cancer web, a, cancer agency website, the BC Cancer Agency website, which was all doom and gloom. So I was terrified. But as time went on, you know, I felt pretty good. And then a friend of mine, a friend of my dad's actually got me involved with a brilliant oncologist, Dr. Klimo, in North Vancouver, and he followed me for about two and a half years with chest x-rays and stuff, and I was fine. Um, in the meantime, my husband and I have been trying to have kids, and um, with no luck, but then in 2000, and that was 2005, 2010, it came back uh, at stage three in one of my lymph nodes in my arm. And at the time, I uh, went back to Dr. Klimo, and he got me in for surgery within four days. And it was only in the one big lymph node, and the other four were clear. So I did three weeks of radiation on my auxilla and a PET scan, and everything looked good. But we made a decision not to have kids. Um, and then, this is where I get emotional. We got pregnant by accident at the end of that year. And I was terrified because the thought of my cancer coming back when I was pregnant was overwhelming. But I felt good and everyone reassured me that I'd be okay. And that my baby would be okay. And then in May, I was about five months pregnant. And my foot went numb. And I instantly thought of a tumor. But... I went to my family doctor and she assured me that, no, you're fine, that's just part of pregnancy. And over a three-week period, that was May 21st, second week I felt like I had the flu, but I was still working. I worked on the downtown east side of Vancouver with, with street kids. And then uh, the third week, uh, all hell broke loose and I <clears throat> lost all the strength in my limbs and I was hospitalized. And then uh, they did a scan of my brain, and they found th two giant tumors in my brain. Oh, and I was six months pregnant. And my, at the time, my body was decompensating quite quickly, and I couldn't walk, I couldn't talk, I couldn't do anything. Um, and the hospital where I was couldn't address the fact that I was pregnant and needed brain surgery. So um, after a couple of days and getting close to death for me and my daughter, um, the uh, 
a lovely obstetrician suggested they were just about to intubate me and keep me on life support long enough to deliver my daughter. And she suggested this other hospital where they could address both. So I was sent lights and sirens to this other hospital where the surgeon, the neurosurgeon on call said, yep, I can get them out. She may never walk or talk again, but I can get them out. And, um, and the other concern at the time, which we weren't aware of, was the transfer, potential transfer to the through the placenta to the baby. Um, so we didn't know that at the time until after my surgery. But um, so he got me in the next two days later. I had both tumors were removed successfully from my brain. It took me about two weeks to walk again and use my limbs again. Um, I could talk right away, but I, it was a long go for the rehab. And my daughter stayed in utero the entire time. She was a trooper. And then I delivered her at 32 weeks so that um, because of the potential transfer, that would be the best decision for her. And then I could start my treatment right away. So I did deliver her on August the 5th of 2011. And then I started my radiation and I did all my other scans because I I knew enough because I'd been connected with Kathy of Save Your Skin that if it was in my brain, it definitely was in other places in my body. So it turned out it was also in my lung and my liver. Um, and then I started the whole brain radiation on the 15th of August for two weeks, very high, as high intensity as they could go with that. And then I started on ipilupinab in September, which I had a great response with but unfortunately I got a colitis response so I had to go on high dose of steroids and I was hospitalized for Maddie's first Christmas for two weeks. Um, Kathy came to visit me on Christmas Eve I think at that time and uh, so that was really hard but the unfortunately the steroid the prednisone kind of nullified the treatment so the treatment although it was working initially kind of halted it so um, and then that unfortunately prevented me from accessing any other clinical trials because I had the colitis response. So when these newer drugs were coming up, I couldn't get them. So for two and a half years, my treatment was surgery. Um, so I had and radiation and I had about, I had surgery on my lung, my breast, my, my back, my chest. Um, and then eventually it got into my small bowel, which was the scariest time because uh, they by the time they realized what was going on in my bowel it had been hiding in the lining of my bowel they had to remove four feet of my small bowel um, and then when I did a PET scan after that it showed that I had 12 other tumors throughout my body that for the first time for me they were inoperable so that was very scary um, and then I was lucky so blessed to get uh, the Pembro, the Keytruda, thanks to Kathy and thanks to our oncologist through Health Canada Compassionate Access. And that pretty much saved my life because within, I think I started in June of 2014 and by December, all of the, the tumors had dissipated and except for one little cheeky one that's still there, if I'm a kidney, but I've been on it now for three years. It'll be coming up three years in June. I go every three weeks and I get regular PET scans and and MRIs every three months. And I have for since I was diagnosed stage four. Um, yeah, it's it's been a hard go, like a journey that I never thought I would be on. But my daughter's healthy. She's in grade she's five years old and she's in kindergarten. And I never thought I'd be able to see him go to preschool. And I'm still here and she's good. So that's my story. Thank you, Shannon. That's, that's I, you know, I hate to say it's beautiful. It's a beautiful story, but um, you're, you're, you're just such a really lovely person. And, and your, your story is such an inspiration for so many other people. And um, with that, I'm going to transfer over to Chris, and Chris is going to tell us a little bit about his story. I, I think we're seeing how, you know, everybody's experience has been so different, and, it, you know, it maybe it sounds like your story, maybe it doesn't sound like your story, but there are so many parallels that we can, we can pull here. So I'm going to stop talking now, and Chris, the floor is yours. 
Can everybody hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. My name is uh, Chris Brochu, and I live in Kamloops, BC currently. I was uh, I used to live in Kelowna, BC, actually for 10, 10 years. I lived there for 10 years. And I was first, uh, my first experience in melanoma was in 2009. I had a mole on my back, the left side of my back, that was uh, looking rather suspicious, and a friend of mine said I should get it checked out. So I had it cut off, and my doctor at the time said it was nothing really to worry about. He just said we should cut it off anyways. It looks suspicious, but at that time he said there was nothing really to worry about. So they did a biopsy of it. And about three weeks later, I got a phone call that it was uh, it was cancerous, and I was I didn't know what anything any idea of what melanoma was at that time. And I researched online about melanoma, and it's a very it was very very serious. All of the uh, the outcomes and 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 everything else was very serious, and I never I never really took it serious. I used to be a sun worshiper and go in the sun and oh I don't know. Uh, I, um, used to be out on the boat lots and everything like that. So, but I never thought of myself as a candidate for skin cancer. I never thought that would be ever something I would ever have to face in my life. So back to the mole, uh, they sent me for a wide excision surgery. So where they go all the way down to the layers of the skin and take out a piece of skin about that big out of my back, and then sew it back up again and put a drain in and all that. And I also did a lymph node biopsy as well at that time under my left arm. And at that time, they found no more traces of cancer cells anywhere in my body that they at that time. Um, but funny thing is, my mom was really concerned about me. So we went all over, searching all over the country for, you know, a treatment of some sort or what is the next step. So we ended up actually going to see Dr. Smiley in Edmonton in 2009. And at that time, he said that there's nothing really we can do for you. We can put you on interferon, but uh, you're stage zero, so there's no real point. It does make your life uh, a more challenge than it is already. So just go back to resume and make your life, and you should be fine the rest of your life. So I went on and carried on with the rest of my life and just was back out and enjoying myself and finishing my career. Uh, my career is a uh, plumber pipe fitter, so I work outside lots, uh, always outside working in the sun. And um, fast forward to May of 2015, uh, I was off work. I had just been laid off a job because that's where you do. It happens when you work construction. You work for um, you work for you know, the job's over, and then you get laid off, and you go find another job. That's just kind of the the way it goes. So I was on my time off, which was nice in May, and I was out hiking. And I'm I'm a pretty physically active guy, and and uh, and I was getting really short of breath. And like to the point where I was keeled over in my head between my knees, and I didn't. I was like, "This is weird. This is not right. There's got to be something wrong with me." And that's the only symptom that I had at the time. So I went to my doctor. I went to the walk-in clinic actually, and they scheduled me for an X-ray. So I went for an X-ray the next day, which was May 5th of 2015, and I went for an X-ray, and I got a phone call within 10 minutes of the X-ray from my doctor. And he said, you should go to emergency right away. This is very serious. He didn't tell me anything of that, anything beyond that at that moment. So I didn't know. I was like, oh, what possibly could it be? So I go to see the emergency doctor in emergency, and they put my uh, x-ray scan up on the screen where you can see it and all that. And I look at the x-ray, and he shows my, my left lung compared to my right lung. My right lung had totally almost collapsed. My lung was the size of my fist. Or normally it should be, you know, half the size of your of your torso. And he said, we're not sure what is going on in your body, but uh, obviously there's something going on and you're right. We're going to hospitalize you here in Kamloops until we figure out what's going on. So I was quite worried. I phoned my mom and my mom was, uh, of course, being the mother that she is, is very worried and, uh, and, uh, so of course she rushes, she rushes to the hospital right away. She was out of chase at the time. Rushes to the hospital right away and comes and sees me. And God, the questions that she was asking was just there was never any questions asking the doctor this and that. And of course I'm in an emergency and they they're busy with other patients and everything else. So they eventually got me a room upstairs in the hospital, and I was there for ten days. They did a which is called a bronchial biopsy where they go down into your 
into your in down through your throat. It's really horrible. Um, but the, like they don't put you to sleep or nothing like that. You have to kind of just deal with it. And so we read the results of that. That was the longest 24 hours of my life, waiting for that was the results of what that was. And the doctor came back, and it was um, stage four metastatic melanoma. So metastatic means it's not operable at that point. So here we go. Um, uh, I went and seen an a, a, a oncologist out of Kelowna, and he uh, prescribed me with a uh, oral chemotherapy pill, which was Mechanis and Tafenlar, which were they would call, which were communication blockers between the cancer cells, so they couldn't talk to each other, and that's how they would stop the spread of the cancer for now. And it was sure it was promised to show great results in some people. So I was very hopeful, and I thought this was going to be it. So I went on the on the oral chemotherapy with Mechanis and Tafenlar, <clears throat> and. Uh, I was feeling starting to feel better and better. Eventually, I was out of the hospital within 10 days, and uh, oh, they also put a chest tube drain in. I forgot about that that part. They put a a, do, a, a tube in, like a, a catheter, into my chest to drain the fluid that was around my lung, so my lung could slowly re um, <coughs> re expand. So I had to have that drained every day, about a liter of fluid every day. If you can imagine a liter bottle. Uh, every day was coming on my body for the first probably month or so and then eventually the drug started to work and I started to feel better um, besides the side effects of uh, sore feet not being able to walk oh, just there was a lot of side effects but we won't go into those we can look those up online um, so fast forward to about I guess it was the end of September I, I do a melanoma walk it's called uh, strides for melanoma an awareness walk and it was my first year doing it was that year and I thought I would do it just to provide awareness for melanoma for people uh, for people so uh, I was out doing that walk and I I found myself uh, not feeling good again that was the end of September of 2015 and I thought oh whatever maybe she's having a bad day or whatever so uh, fast forward 10 days later I ended up back in the hospital here in Kamloops again, uh, I was sick, I was throwing up, I couldn't keep food down, couldn't keep water down. Uh, basically what, is, what had happened is the drugs had stopped working and the cancer had come back um, very, very aggressively. So they did another CT scan on me and an x-ray and they found out that the cancer had spread to my kidneys at that time. And um, there was no other treatment option at that time. Uh, so we were searching high and low. We went and seen a oncologist, or sorry, a naturopath out of Vancouver, and he talked to us about immunotherapy. And my oncologist at the time out of Kelowna had no idea what immunotherapy was. That's what he told us. But uh, this, well, this naturopath said, yes, he had a couple of clients that have been on immunotherapy, and they've done very, very well at it. So uh, we put the word out there and just really – thought about immunotherapy, thought that was the next step. And luckily for me, a clinical study opened up in Edmonton. So I was in the hospital here in Kamloops, BC, and one day they uh, packaged me up, got, set me on a plane, and flew me to Edmonton. And I started the clinical trial the next day in Edmonton of uh, Ipanema Lab and the Volume Lab. Uh, the doctor there, my doctor there said that we have, this is a, a very new treatment. We're not sure how the outcome is going to be. It either works for you or doesn't work for you, but be prepared to get your affairs in order and basically pack up your tent is what he said. Because uh, if this doesn't work, there's no other, there's nothing else out there for you. Uh, the stage of cancer that it's at and the, how fast it is progressing in your body. So uh, I did my first uh, cycle of uh, Epilema Lab and the Volume Lab together. Yeah, that was a, just before Halloween of 2015, and uh, I, I, I didn't have any side effects right away, which was nice, and then I ended up getting sicker. The cancer was very strong, and I ended up being a full-time patient at the Cross Cancer Clinic in Edmonton for uh, just until just before Christmas of 2015, so I got out December 21st of Christmas 2015. Uh, so the treatment that they put you on for the first four cycles is uh, every three weeks of treatment of volume lab and ipilimumab. Uh, so that 
So then my, eventually my body started to get stronger and stronger. I couldn't even walk to the washroom. I had to go wheelchair everywhere. Um, sick to my stomach. I lost a lot of weight. I was down to 160 pounds. I'm normally a 200 pound guy, so I lost quite a bit of weight. Slowly, slowly, slowly my body uh, came around. And I had a complete response to the, uh, the treatment, which was amazing. Um, I was very lucky that I had a complete response with no side effects whatsoever to the immunotherapy. <clears throat> and uh, so I was doing that for a whole year of the clinical trial, or study, sorry. So a whole year, every two weeks, flying to Edmonton from Kamloops. And I'm so grateful to, uh, to, new, to new treatments out there. It's amazing how well I have responded and there was nothing else for me at the time so that's my story. Um, there's a lot more to it of course but I don't want to bore you guys and bore everybody else but uh, here I am uh, living healthy again and well, back to my old self which is pretty cool. I never thought I would ever see the, uh, see this part of this journey. I, didn't, I was so sick at one point I didn't think I would ever uh, see this uh, point of my journey again. Here I am, and uh, living life again, and loving it, and I uh, really want to help people else, help other people out that are going through the same sort of journey that I was going through. That there is life after uh, such a, a scary diagnosis of stage four metastatic melanoma. So thank you for listening, and that's uh, that's it. Thank you, Chris. And um, of course, if anybody wants to connect with any of the panelists, you please feel free to send me an email, and I and I will I will connect you with anybody that you would like to speak with. And on that, I will um, shift over to Lyle, who's going to tell us his story. Are you ready for me? Can you hear me? Yes, we are. yes, we're ready for you, yeah. and we can. Okay, first of all, it's very nice to meet Shannon and Chris, and of course, lovely Kathy, who I know very well. Um, I said it, this medicine gets me uh, emotional, like what Shannon said. But uh, to start off, I'm, uh, I live in Vancouver Island, just outside Nanaimo. Uh, lovely place. I've been here for about 11 years. Used to live in Vancouver, so it's a, it's a nice change. But let me say, oh, my. Uh, self-pity has ended after I heard these stories and, and what everybody's gone through. My my version is going to be a lot more boring than everybody else. It's uh, it's amazing what you've gone through and congratulations to, to all of you. Um, to start my story, uh, I've got uh, melanoma, of course. It, for me, it was like a little blood blister on my chest. I saw it one day in late August 2015, poked it, blood came out. I thought, okay, that's good, it's done, you know. And then about a week later, it came back up again. This time I showed my wife. She said, you better get, uh, you better go to the doctor. So I did go to the doctor. Uh, he he took a biopsy, and within about two days later, he called me back and says it's melanoma. And much like the other stories, I, I didn't even know what melanoma was. had no clue. Just heard about it after. And I says, is it bad? And they go, yeah, it's, it's bad. And I said, okay, well, it's not the greatest news in the world, but thanks. And what they ended up doing is uh, they operated real quick on me about September 5th. I've had, I've had fabulous medical attention. And uh, I think I'm very lucky and, and fortunate and thankful to God for, for, for all of these things. But I got operated September 5th and it was on my chest and the tumor was on my chest. And they said it was quite large and went right down to the bone and at the same time they took out a couple of my lip nodes, sentinel lip nodes. One showed no cancer at all, the other one showed just a small small amount and there was a third node they took out and they had no cancer. So um, I, I, I got in touch with uh, in Victoria, they sent me to Dr. Bernstein who's fabulous. If you want to get told straight to the point, she'll tell you straight to the point. She's uh, very, very good in what you did. Uh, and what they did is they put me, she said, well, Lyle, um, what we think you should go on is interferon because you're only in stage three right now. And we think, it, you know, she wasn't excited by it. It had mixed reviews, more negative than positive. And uh, as been said, people have taken interferon. I don't, I don't know how Kathy did it for as long as she did it, but uh, <laughs> 
small package, tough package there, right? I'm six six, and I said, wow, if she can do it, I better be able to do it. And then I started taking it in uh, in November for uh, I was supposed to go 20 days in a row, so I had the weekends off. And you know, you get it about 1:30, and then by about three o'clock, feel sick, feel like puking, you get these high fevers, migraine headaches, and I go. From Kathy, go you. How long did you go in this? She told me that whole year. I go, oh my god. So I figured I better tough it out. I I, I toughed it out. I had mine till uh, mid December. Bernstein was happy. She had sent me home. I just started. Uh, they gave me Christmas break. They, I started doing my self injections, but I had my CAT scan in early January. And at the time, I should go back when they did my operation. They go, looks good, Lyle. They. Uh, doesn't look like it spread from the original operation and they had taken out about another 15 nodes in October and 14 of them were good and just a small trace in one of them. So that was all good and then in January they said uh, they saw the CAT scan they go no interference not working because on my on my liver they found three little tumors where back in September when they first did a CAT scan they said it was just a red rash, so they didn't even identify it as as, uh, as melanoma. So I said, "What what next?" And uh, and actually, I should step back a bit. When I met Dr. Bernstein, uh, I said, "Well, what what should I do?" She goes, "Well, if I was you, I wouldn't go on uh, on the website. It shows nothing but negativity on there." She goes, "Except for one." She goes, "You should go on the Save Your Skin website by Kathy Bernard." I go, "Kathy Bernard." I go, I know that name. I go, I go. Is she short, cute? And she goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. She is. And I go, well, Kathy and I. So you don't, if you don't know, we worked together at ICBC for, uh, I don't know, a number of years. We're in different areas, but uh, we hooked up. She was ahead of the social club. And at that time, we used to do that lip syncing thing, and we dressed up as Sunny and Cher. She dressed up as Sunny. I had to dress up as Cher. So that was our, that was our original meeting. But once I found out. When I saw it, I called Kathy up, and I'll tell you, I can only say this about Kathy. She's a lifesaver. Great. Great lady. Okay. Um, that's what I mean. The harder they, taller they are, the harder they fall, right? Uh, so what, what, what unfolded after Kathy kept in great contact with me, Dr. Bernstein, when I went to see her in Victoria after, and I said, well, what would you do, Doc? Tell me, what would you do in my case? She goes, well, by this time now, I put it stage four in the January 2016. She we got a clinical trial. We might be able to get you. And it was exactly what Chris was taking. I had the FB and the, uh, and the new one. So uh, I started that in, in March of 2016. And... The reports initially were that, you know, usually after three months, they're going to find out it's not working after three months. Who knows? But ironically, I was I, I had to go to Vancouver to get this, and I had the combo treatment. There was four of them I was supposed to get once every three weeks. But I did have some side effects. I had some problems with my liver, had some problems with my thyroid, had some problems with my heart rate. It went a little crazy. So I had to go and try to zone again. And... Uh, do that so there was breaks. I only got three of those double treatments and uh, anytime you don't get a treatment I'm sure like everybody else you're nervous so, you know how's it affecting you or not affecting you and you get nervous about it but it did the three and then they did a uh, and then they put me on uh, the cycle once every two weeks for 48 weeks uh, similar to what uh, Chris said. As a matter of fact I just had my my very last treatment last week uh, May 11th. So I've been off and on of that because uh, my numbers have gone up in my thyroid and my liver, and my liver's gone back up, so they have to postpone it. I had to postpone it again in December, January for a two-month period there. But I got my uh, my CAT scan in February, and the doctor said, well, you got one on your lung, and you got the three in the liver, and he goes, you got a couple others. He goes, um, he says, but they hadn't grown, and they said the ones on the liver had shrunk a little bit. So he said that was good news. I said, well, I like to hear good news. So uh, that's sort of where I'm sitting at this particular time. I, uh, I'm waiting till next uh, June 1st. I get my uh, my CAT scan results, and what happens after that, I don't know. I mean, hopefully it's working. Uh, much like Chris said, I don't know 
if there's anything else out there right now, it doesn't sound like there's anything else out there, but there could be new drugs coming ahead. And with the work from Kathy and what they're doing, it's fabulous that new stuff does come up because as Bernstein told me, she goes, well, you're lucky you didn't get this 10 years ago. You probably wouldn't be around. And, 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 and that said it all to me. Right. So, uh, like, like these inspirational people that have just spoken, uh, Shannon and Chris and Kathy, I just want to do my part too. And, and if there's anybody that needs to talk or anything of that nature, we've all got our own stories. I know, uh, if I had talked to Shannon and Chris earlier, they would have made my life a lot easier, so I wouldn't whine like a little baby about me because what you guys have gone through is phenomenal. And I'm so proud of you, all three of you. And uh, keep it going. You're the inspiration. That's it. Thank you, Lyle. Um, I, I do want to say you did, you did say that, you know, you talked about the Right now, the Nevo IPI is the, the standard of care for melanoma, but we are seeing other things in development and other things coming down the pipeline. So that's what I wanted to say about that. But I, I, Kathy, you said something to me that really, really struck me. So I'm, I'm going to ask all four of you this question. Uh, Kathy, you talked about a new normal. And I, I'm curious to know, do you feel like you all have a new normal now? Or have you gone back to what your normal used to be? Or, you know, is it, what's new normal for you? Or, or what's normal for you? And Kathy, maybe you can start. Oh, it's, it's, it's a new normal. Um, some days it's a good normal. Some days it's a bad normal. Um, the bad normals are last week when I had to get ready for my doctor's appointment. Um, and I have to tell you, it's a very, uh, it, it's a weird process. Uh, I'm nervous the day before. Uh, I'm nervous right after the appointment. For most of you who know me, I think they named a doll after me once, Chatty Kathy. Uh, but those are the two days you don't hear much from me. My husband and I always leave the appointment, even with good, good news, and we're pretty quiet for the rest of the day. It's exhausting. Um, same as the day when I get my scan. So it's a new normal for me. Um, but you know what? I, I swore after all this I wouldn't take uh, small stuff for granted, but it didn't take me long before I still take small stuff for granted. Um, I still bitch a little bit about stuff that is really irrelevant. But... Um, I know how lucky and how grateful I am to be alive. I have to tell you, in the beginning of starting the foundation, it was extremely hard for me. From I think I even got survival guilt because in those first days, we weren't seeing a lot of people survive, and it was really, really difficult for me to sort of be that last person standing. I didn't understand why. Sometimes I still don't. Um, so yeah, it's it's a new normal, but. Times have changed. I mean, look at the incredible people on your screen. Um, you know, we are the real world evidence, and I think we're living proof that things are changing, and we just hope they continue to change for us. Thanks. And does anybody else want to answer that? Sure. I'll, I'll, uh, uh, I, I could. Oh, sorry, Lyle. Yeah, I can answer. Lyle, why don't you go ahead? Okay. Um, I, I've got a, I mean, what, what uh, Kathy just said about new normal, my wife raised the same, uh, same wording. And, and I think that's one thing that hasn't been said here, but, but we all feel it. And Shannon reflected on her with respect to her husband. Uh, the real pillars are the ones that are there, your, uh, your spouses <laughs> or best friends or whatever it may be, but they, they're the ones every day that have to look through it. And, what Kathy said, it's interesting, even about that, about the, the guilt feeling. Sometimes I almost feel guilty that everyone's asking, how are you doing, how are you doing? And no one's asking, how's, your, how's my wife doing, how are my kids doing, and things of that nature, because it's as tough for them as it is for us. I'm sure everybody agrees with that. So I really felt that that is the case. I'm both taking things for, for granted. Yeah, it's, it's weird how reality kicks back in. But I think I can truly say that... Uh, out of all this group, I mean, I'm the oldest. I'm 64 now, and I just had it a couple of years ago. I I, I felt fortuitous in a lot of ways that uh, you know, if you get me, not that I don't want to be around for another 30 years. I do, but uh, I look when I went to the hospital and you see the younger people and things of that nature, and and you're going, wow, 
why is it hitting them? You know, they haven't even lived life yet, right? So uh, from that perspective, to me, every day is, uh, is, is exactly what Kathy says. Sometimes you, you forget you actually got it or you want to forget, I guess. <laughs> and you think, no, it's, everything's good. But the closer you get, and, you know, those seven days right now are counting down and every day I'm wondering what's going to happen and, 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 and do it. And I guess that is the new normal that uh, you don't know how long it's going to be with you or how long you're, you're good and not good. But I do appreciate every day more, especially with my, my, my wife and my kids and my, my extended, my family and my friends. So, uh, and I used to sweat the small stuff big time all the time. Now I sweat it for a little bit and get rid of it. So it's uh, it's it is a new normal, but but it's it's a good one. It, we, our family is as close as we were, and I think we're a very close family. Express yourself. We're probably more closer now than we've ever been, and I, and I think maybe that's the good that comes out of some of these things. So okay, enough for me. Thank you. Thank you, Lyle Shannon. Yeah, I think it's um, for me. It, it was such a life changing thing. For I mean, my husband especially, because when we went into the hospital, I was unconscious most of the time. So he had to deal with being told that you're going to lose your wife and your daughter. And then it was just, you're going to lose your wife. So the trauma, and he's a big, tough fire guy, so he doesn't think that even now, he's like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with all of that stuff. <laughs> um, but you just really appreciate the simple stuff. And like Kathy says, there's days that you kind of forget about it and then you're, you get frustrated about these little ridiculous things and then you kind of have a, a check with yourself saying, wow, I wasn't even supposed to be here. My daughter wasn't even supposed to be here. And she's five and she loves life and she has no idea that I have cancer. She thinks that, mommy, I tell her that I have some cheeky cells because I think I had three surgeries after she was born and she'd come to visit me and count my buttons and my staples and stuff and it just for me it just it's changed but it's not necessarily kind of getting to the closer to the getting through what we went through it's an it's a good change because what I I found through Kathy because she guided me through all of this mess that I had the last six years now and still going on because I still do treatment and my scans and stuff and that's worse the scan anxiety even though I think, okay, everything should be okay, it's still, oh my God, what if it isn't? And then when, what happens when I get taken off of the treatment? And so I'm hanging on to the treatment as long as I can because right now I haven't had any negative side effects really other than my thyroid. So it's just a whole new appreciation for the simple things and keeping your mind on focused on that stuff and not letting the cancer define who you are you still you know and I want I love the fact that I can actually share my story and how many times I've shared my story and then two weeks later the person comes up to me and says hey my aunt just got diagnosed with melanoma where should she go what should she do and that's really I think now what what my role is as my, my job, I would say, uh, as volunteer job, is just to help people out with those moments of anxiety, whatever actually kind of cancer it is. And um, I just feel so blessed that I'm here to do that. And, and seeing my daughter grow up, it's like the best gift in the entire world because she was followed for 19 months because of the potential transfer. And that was a big kick in the face for me. Yeah, those what was me days and why me and poor me and then you go into the oncology clinic at children's hospital and you see these little peanuts running around that are, have cancer and just big smiles on their faces and thinking what do I have to whine about I am here and my first counselor I still do counseling at BC cancer and she I remember she said to me cancer may take your life one day but you could go out in two weeks and get hit by a bus and then you're all you're doing in the last two weeks of your life is whining about cancer so just basically get over it and live your life so that's what I try to do thank you Shannon Chris yeah for me um, life has definitely changed that's for sure I uh, no longer do the same job I used to do that's for sure like I used to work out of town for 14 days in a row uh, high stress, high, you know, not enough sleep, not enough taking care of my body. 
Um, I definitely now definitely take care of my body a lot more. I'm way more physically active than I ever was before. I eat healthier. Um, I get more sleep. And uh, money's not that important to me anymore. Where money was my drive before. Money was my all-time goal was to make as much money as I could. And now that's not even like, close to important anymore. So I don't do the same job anymore. And it's way less stress in my life. And I really do actually I, I enjoy my life a lot more now. Funny, funny thing, uh, how I became this different person. And uh, I may have lost some friends along the way, and that's just the way it goes. But um, yeah, life is totally, is actually uh, almost, I wouldn't say it's better. Um, but it's far less stressful right now for me. And I really, I think that's very important when you have this kind of, uh, this diagnosis of, of, uh, of a stage four cancer of any kind is uh, stress is I think is the number one killer when it comes to diseases like this and that's why people get them I think is 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 stress stress is is definitely a factor I think in the whole in the whole situation and for my family it, that totally changed as well too they um, we're, we're definitely a lot closer now which is really really important I think and before we weren't so close so it's uh, it's very nice because I was away all the time working I'd never see them I wouldn't see them you know for months at a time so we see each other quite often now which is quite which is very nice and that's important uh, I don't have any kids or anything like that so it's just me and my dog and um, I really want to spread the word that there is life after cancer and um, there's life during cancer as well um, you know, like during during your disease and during your diagnosis and all that, there's life as well. Like, uh, what chance that you could get hit by a car? You don't know. So really, uh, for me, it's enjoying every day and being grateful to be here. Uh, I don't know if I was supposed to be here, but I guess I am now. So it's pretty pretty neat to have that. Um, yeah, that's basically my life after cancer, and. Um, I really want to help people. That's why I'm doing all these fundraisers and doing everything else. Is I want to help the people for the future too that are going through the same thing that can maybe have a better outcome than that uh, than we've we've all had. You know, we have a lot of really good outcomes, but it hasn't been a, a short journey. That's for sure. It's been a very long journey. It'd be nice if there was um, maybe more prevention out there for uh, for all all cancers in general. Um, my feeling is that it it has to do with our diets. Our exercise and our stress levels in our life is is a big contributing factor to uh, to disease, and I think that we can change that as a as a, as a people, as a population. We can all change that, and uh, I really hope that uh, maybe we can put this message out there, and people um, will change their diet, or will change their stress level in their life, or change their life, and do something they really enjoy, and not something that they have to do, you know. Uh, anyways, that's that's my life after cancer, and I hope that everybody else is is doing just as well. So, thank you. So I I heard you know Kathy, you talked about about Scotty, your husband, and Shannon, you talked about your husband, and Lyle, you talked about your your wife and your children who are who are slightly older. Um, so. Did, were you were you were they a huge support or resource for you as you were going through your journey? And what other um, resources or tools or support did you did you use as you were going through it so that you could get to the point where you are today? And uh, Kathy, would you? We haven't heard your voice in a while, Chatty Kathy. Would you like to to start that one? Well. Um... Sabrina, you know, that's really why we started the foundation because it wasn't for my family and like all my family and complete strangers. Oh my God, I can't even imagine where I would have been. I mean, my older son was really saved my life. He found the doctor in the States and he phoned her or phoned him and said, you need to save my mom. And uh, that's how I got that treatment or we would have never known about it. So, um, they play a big role. I think the hardest thing for me as a mom and a wife and an aunt, um, I have, Shannon knows a lot of my family. Um, I'm really important to them. and They're incredibly important to me. And really watching how and what it did to them was hard for me. Um, as a mom and a woman, I think we're always trying to fix things. And sometimes by fixing it, I didn't do the right thing. Um, you know, it, 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 it it's hard. And and Lyle's right, you know, when you're diagnosed with cancer, I think we can all say we put our head down and did what we had to do. 
Shannon apparently went to sleep. <laughs> um, yeah, but I mean, it's the people around us that flounder. I used to describe it the very first time I wrote about my journey. I didn't even want to. And I wrote about it like this. I said, it's like a roller coaster ride and I'm the front car. So I can see all the twists and the turns and the ups and the downs. So I, I'm there. I'm in the front and I can see it. But my family and my loved ones behind me are the back cars that are holding on to me. And they are getting swung and bumped and flipped around on that ride because they can't see. They're trying to save me. They're trying to hold on to me. And um, their ride, and for anybody who's been on a roller coaster, it's a lot tougher on the back than the front. I can tell you that. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of how I described it. For them, they were hanging on to me for dear life. Mm -hmm. And um, if they hadn't have, I don't think I would have been here. When I had to go back for my second IL-2 treatment, which was horrific, I remember them pulling me out of the closet. I was in there saying, no more. I can't do this. I can't spend all this money when I, the, you know, the survival rate is so low and I'm not going. And my sister was hauling me out. <laughs> called her my little pit bull. She was having nothing to do with any of that. So I, I, I the loved ones go through a whole different process. Mm. Karen? Yeah, I, I agree with, like, for my family, um, Brad, um, initially when they thought I was going to die, and he gathered all my parents, my, our family, our friends, everybody to help him make a decision. Um, the trauma that he must have gone through in those days, it's just, and like I was unconscious, like I said, so I, I was unaware other than people kept coming in two by two to sit with me. And now I know they were coming in to say goodbye. So yeah. that for sure, but really it's, it's been Kathy. Um, and I heard about her in 2005 when I was first diagnosed, turns out that my husband's who best friend who was our best man is Kathy's nephew and I was diagnosed with my mole and he said remember him saying oh my aunt was given three three months to live in 2003 you'll be fine she started this foundation and all this. so that stuck in my head so when I you know when I turned stage three I just googled her and called her up and but yeah it's it's an ongoing and even now my my mom and dad especially and Brad doesn't, my husband doesn't talk about it as much, but I can, I know it's there. He just doesn't display it openly, his anxiety for stuff. Um, my parents still, I mean, every time I get a clean scan, it's like the this huge <laughs> sigh of relief. And it's, it's hard because for me, it's just, I don't want to be worrying about them worrying about me. So it's kind of keeping that balance and, and it's, Taking care of, I go to counseling on a regular basis because I need to take care of my own stuff. Um, I realize now it's not about you know my husband or my parents or even my friends. Sometimes, you know, it's about me figuring it out for myself so that I can spend my time with them, not talking about my fears about my cancer. So, um, and my animals. I my parents had a farm. I remember in the early days with with Maddie. Um, and she has been the biggest, I have to say, because no matter how crappy I was feeling or how, even after surgeries, I had multiple surgeries when she was little and I would have to get up every day and take care of that little girl. And I didn't ask for help because it kept me distracted. It kept me moving. It kept me living even when I felt like laying in bed all day. And so we'd go up to the farm and my horses were there and it was just, that was my therapeutic space. And it was finding those spaces for me just to help me get through the stuff. Um, yeah, but she is just my little miracle because not only did we not expect to even have a child, she's healthy, she's fine, and she's uh, just full of, full of sass and energy. So she keeps me going and she has all this time the last six years, she'll be six in August. So it's just all those people in your life. But it's for me, it was getting my head around. And when I'm having a bad day, I book a counseling appointment and I go in and, and talk to my counselor. And it, it's so helpful. 
Thank you. Uh, we're just coming up to one o'clock, but I, I do have a question that I want to ask, and it's a question from uh, from the audience. Um, so uh, Daria is asking, and I won't ask you to comment on, on the question exactly, but I'll just read it out and then we can have a discussion about it. I hear a lot of cases where cancer comes back in various forms just a few years after discovery of melanoma. I'm terrified. Is this always the case and should I, and I should just be ready for this? Is there anything I could do apart from regular dermatology check-ins? So Daria, you and I can speak about this offline, but I just want to ask you, uh, and Chris, I'll, I'll ask you, do you, is that something that you're concerned with? Do you feel like you're always thinking about, you know, what if my cancer comes back? What if it comes back as something else? I, I think you have to, um, you have to think about that um, for sure. It, it has a chance of coming back, but I don't think you have to let that ruin, ruin your life because if you do, I believe that uh, what you think will happen. So if you think it's going to come back, it's going to come back. If you don't think it's going to come back, then it's not going to come back. So I think you have to keep it, be in the right mindset the whole, all the time. Uh, that's a really big thing. And and have a good support system out there is, is number one for sure. Have a good support system is number one. Uh, the chance of melanoma coming back for me in particular, I guess, is quite high because stage four metastatic melanoma is quite high. But I, I don't think of it that way. I, I think that I'm cured. So uh, my best advice would be to uh, think it's not coming back and to live your life and do what you want to do and have as much fun as possible. And, and Lyle, do you want to do you want to touch on that a little bit? I, I mean, I, I think, I think that, you know much what uh, Kristen Shannon said. I, I I tend to agree. I mean, absolutely, it's on your mind, but you don't focus on it, at least I don't focus on it, I try to get out of my mind and just think the positive things and uh, see what I've got and move forward and deal with it as, as it comes. Um, you know, going back to what Shannon said about her family and her husband and, and that, I mean, the toughest part for me was my boys were 26 and 25 at the time, but telling them that I had cancer, tell my wife, it, that was tough. That was tough because, I mean, when you're an individual, you know, you say, well, it is with you, but you always feel that you're the provider in a lot of ways. Not to sound chauvinistic, but that you want to be the power of strength and really show no type of emotions. I mean, I cried more in the last two years than I did in you know, 60 years of, uh, of living, you know, because I always thought that was a sign of weakness. Now I just think it's good. It's good to be yourself. It's good to share what you've got to share. And, and maybe that's the other message out of this going off that question a bit is the fact that I found it so rewarding because I think to a degree everyone wants their privacy and I didn't want to say anything like Kathy said she didn't want to. I really didn't. I, I, I wanted to keep it quiet um, but I saw one of my buddies speak because he had prostate cancer and I saw the impact it had on people when he spoke and this was before I even had cancer and it, uh, you know, it made a difference. To some people in that audience, he made a difference. I don't know how many, but he made a difference because you can see it in the eyes of the people. And uh, and I think if we can make a difference, and I think we're all saying the same thing for one person, then I think, you know, we've done good. And uh, that's why I'm not afraid to share it uh, to anyone who wants to listen. Sometimes people get tired of hearing me talk. So, But uh, but that's, that's the essence of what this thing is about for me, too. It's just let's spread the word. Support great people like what uh, Kathy's doing. I mean, she's so much above what I could end of ever wanting to do or let alone trying to do. Uh, her her foundation has helped a lot of us. Look at the smiles and Chris and Shannon. I see it. I mean, and, and money can't buy that. So so thank you to Kathy for that. And that actually will bring me to my to my last question, and, and uh, we are at almost five minutes past one. So I'll just ask you, just you know, in a sentence, how do you feel that has sharing your story helped you? So, um, Shannon, do you want to start? Sharing my story has helped me so much, and I think is an entangled part of what's helped me get through it all because I think it's it's talking about it is so healthy and sharing it and being a support for other people that are going through it and you don't feel alone. Um, when I connected with Kathy initially, I felt I didn't feel alone in it and I felt 
I was with a group of people that knew what I was going through and I want to be that for other people um, and I have the the privilege of, of doing that and it's it's helping me um, yeah I, 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 I wouldn't have it any other way Chris yeah for sure Sh sharing my story has helped me a lot um, it's helped me get my uh, get over some 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 stumbling blocks in my life and it's helped me to help other people is really a, a gratifying experience if I can help one person or one person has a similar story of mine while I was sick if someone had a similar story as mine I could pull the good stuff from that story and really uh, focus on the good the good parts of that story because we you know you re re research on the internet and you try and self diagnose yourself when you're originally officially diagnosed and it's it's a lot of negative out there there's not a lot of the of the positive story side of stories out there though on, on the internet unfortunately and we, we need to change that I think that that there is a lot of uh, positive stories out there that need to be you know um, shared with the world and, and I think that really helps me and helps people um, from for specifically for me what has helped me a lot is is talking to my friends about it and help, 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 having them understand you know and and uh, and and getting their feedback has really helped me a lot so that's why that's why I think this is, a, is very important is to to help others out there that are going through it and um, let them know that there is hope out there so um, on that Kathy I'm just gonna ask you to speak very very briefly about I'm living proof and then uh, we'll we'll wrap up actually I was just jotting that down I think I have to tell you when Shannon you know, was talking about talking to other people and Chris and I know Lyle and I talk a lot. I think what we did three years ago is that we held because we had survivors uh, that we didn't couldn't find back in 2003 as, as easily. We held two meetings, one uh, in Quebec and one in Vancouver, uh, where we invited a ton of melanoma patients that we could find, all to sort of sit around and discuss what survivorship actually meant to us. Like, is you know, we all had this interpretation that you know maybe it's five years clear I don't know what is it and we sat around and most of us talked for the day I know the one in Quebec uh, we ended up sending our partners and husbands and family home because the seven of us there just wanted to hang around with each other for the remainder of the day it was like this bond that we had developed with these people that it was so nobody else shared what we were sharing that day but I think for me what was in Incredible is in Vancouver. We had organized a lunch, and I had Dr. Michael Smiley there with us. And him and I walked down into the room where the lunch was. And when we opened the door, and there was 20 families there, it actually took my breath away. Then he took his breath away. That actually we were now there was there was more of us than we had seen in years. And for you that know Dr. Smiley, he's been working in melanoma for eternity. Uh, so I always said, you know, look at these people because ultimately they wouldn't be here even if they haven't seen you without the work you do because he's led melanoma forever. So what we really wanted to do was start sharing stories and we developed a program called I'm Living Proof. I think everybody here uh, that's been speaking today is on that website. It's imlivingproof.ca. We wanted to connect people around the world so that we would put your story up, a picture up, a video up if you wanted to do a video. If people that were newly diagnosed wanted to talk in particular to one of the people that they saw on the I'm Living Proof, they would contact us when we would make sure it was okay with those people that we connected them. I can tell you, I know for a fact, Shannon is connected with uh, a lot of people through the I'm Living Proof. Um, I haven't looked at it lately, so Chris, Lal, I'm sorry if you've been out connecting and, and, and I haven't been keeping out on track. But uh, now we really want to open that I'm Living Proof to more than just us. Uh, for some of us, we've been fortunate enough to get some of these new, innovative, targeted, and immunotherapies. There's a lot more of us surviving now. Uh, the, we're seeing these, these treatments go to other cancer patients besides melanoma. And, you know, I always used to say, and I'll, I'll revert to a slide that Sabrina just presented in Europe, melanoma used to be, we used to be riding in the back of the bus, and now we are all driving the bus in cancer and um, treatments for people. So 
I think now we don't all just have a due diligence for people with melanoma. I think every one of us today and every survivor out there in melanoma or even that's being treated with melanoma has a due diligence, due diligence to everybody that's going to be faced with a cancer diagnosis in the future because we've been there. Uh, these treatments are now coming to other people in lung and renal cell, et cetera, et cetera. And now we can help guide them through a, a pretty tough journey. Thank you. So um, if anybody who, who is on the line and listening would like to participate in I'm Living Proof, you can email uh, Kathy or myself and you can find more information about I'm Living Proof at imlivingproof.ca or even if you go to the Save Your Skin website, saveyourskin.ca, you'll see that there's information about that program there. And uh, with that, I want to say, oh, the, the webinar will be archived and available at the Save Your Skin website. We will be presenting our next webinar next June, so you can look to our website for more information about that. Thank you again to everybody who came on the line to, um, to listen to the webinar today, and thank you especially to Kathy, Chris, Shannon, and Lion for while for being with us today. So thank you everyone, and have a good rest of the day. Bye. Bye everyone.